the Virginia Horse Industry Board, Southwest Virginia Agricultural Association, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, offering its hardest working, smoothest riding off-road ATVs, led by the rugged, more powerful Sportsman 850HO, hunt far more trail. Polaris has the Sportsman ATV you want at Polaris.com. Brought to you by Farm Family, Life, Auto, Business, Farm. Jim Gray, farmer's son, agribusiness owner, insurance agent. Another personal story on farmfamilypeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Cicadas, often referred to as locusts, will be emerging very soon. This week we'll talk about the insect, the damage it can cause, and ways to prevent that damage when Eric Day, an extension specialist and entomologist with Virginia Tech, joins us on Ag Insights. We'll also talk about insect control when we go in the garden, and we'll have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. Sabra Dipping Company, the country's leading hummus manufacturer, will invest $86 million to further expand its manufacturing capacity in Chesterfield County. The company will further increase production capabilities and as a result will add 140 new jobs over the next several years. This expansion brings the total jobs announced for the Chesterfield operation to nearly 500 since opening in 2010. The chickpeas or garbanzo beans used to make Sabra hummus are grown mostly in the Pacific Northwest. However, numerous field tests are currently taking place here in the Commonwealth to see if those beans can be grown here in Virginia. Well, the garbanzo beans are not yet grown in Virginia, but soybeans are. Montague Farms, a family-owned producer and exporter of specialty soybeans based in Center Cross, Virginia, reached a new agreement to supply food-grade soybeans to a customer in Japan. The specialty soybeans will be imported by Tokyo-based Sun Tommy International Company and distributed to food processors in Japan. The soybeans will be used to make natto, a fermented breakfast food that is considered a traditional delicacy in Japan. Well, Eco Tulips in Madison County is the only certified organic flower bulb company in the U.S. And that is a story that started with love. Usually we think of roses as the flower of love, but for Carrie Ann and Yaroon Kuman of Madison County, it's tulips. About uh, four years ago, I, uh, I was working in the United States uh, for a uh, Dutch company and I met, uh, I met a girl and I wanted uh, to uh, have a reason to stay. That girl, Carrie Ann, was all about being eco-friendly. Jeroen's background, on the other hand, was large-scale commercial tulip farming. Kind of together we came up with, uh, with eco-tulips, uh, organically grown bulbs. To find out more about growing organic tulips, the couple traveled to Jeroen's homeland of Holland. We went and toured Wilbur Brockman's fields of organic tulips and my husband was blown away. He didn't even think it was possible to have such beautiful high quality tulips that pesticides weren't used. That trip opened Jeroen's eyes to organic sustainable farming. Uh, important that people can uh, see how you uh, can uh, grow food or flowers just with a shovel and a good attitude. Cheapest flower, the cheapest food is not always the best choice. The only certified organic flower bulb company in the U.S., Eco Tulips uses no pesticides or insecticides. The, the chemicals don't, don't only harm the, um, the, the people who are working uh, uh, with uh, the flowers, but also the ecosystem where the flowers are grown in. The biggest question we always get is, 
you know, why organic if we don't eat it? And it's a really important question to start taking a look at because even though we don't eat it, we're still putting chemicals into the soil, which is affecting our waterways. It's, it, those, those pesticides are killing those microorganisms in the soil. And there is a huge problem right now with honeybee hive collapse, and um, which they're, you know, looking at the farming system as a whole. And, you know, one of the culprits that is being looked at is pesticide use. The couple wants to promote organic and sustainable farming. We uh, have a heavily discounted program for farmers because we really want to promote uh, small-scale flower farming where we give the, the farmers 70% discount. Um, this is on a website called ecotulipswholesale.com. And they strive to educate as well, going as far as offering bulb fundraisers. We have a fabulous, really successful bulb fundraiser. Any organization that wants to do a fundraiser can sell our organic bulbs as their fundraiser. We do a 50-50 split, so they get a very nice portion of the fundraising. And it also, again, adds that extra level of education, of learning something more about organic gardening. And um, so that makes us really happy. The Cumin success has led to a tulip festival held each spring in Madison County's Arota. We just moved to this property this year. Uh, we need more parking. I wanted to, well, you and I both wanted to add more of an educational component to the festival so it wasn't just about the flowers. If people want to come and just hang out with the flowers, great, but if they want to learn a little bit more about organic gardening um, or honeybees, pollinators, we wanted to be able to add that. So we were really excited to add workshops and guest speakers this year. That's where it's all about. Uh, people are picking and they are, they are all going happy home uh, with beautiful bouquet. And, uh, and a great experience. Farmers in Southwest Virginia are opposing the proposal to prohibit any hunting of elk in Lee, Russell, Scott, and Tazewell counties. Despite the earlier opposition from farmers in the region, the Virginia Game Department moved ahead with importing a small herd of elk from Kentucky for a pilot program in Buchanan, Dickinson, and Wise counties. The department also plans to bring in 24 more elk from Kentucky this month. Now, cattle producers are worried that elk could expose their herds to animal diseases such as brucellosis, bovine tuberculosis, and chronic wasting disease, costing them thousands of dollars in lost sales due to quarantine requirements and increased vaccination costs. Now, Farm Bureau members are urging farmers and other concerned citizens to oppose closing the hunting season, which runs through mid-May. Comments can be shared by mail or made online at dgif.virginia.gov. Well, when cattlemen are raising animals destined for the feed yard, there are steps they can take to ensure positive performance. In this segment, Cindy Campbell shares why preconditioning programs are so important to feedlot managers. A lot of people say they've had all the shots. Well, we don't know what that means. What sounds like a good selling point on the ranch may not carry much weight down the road. Cattle feeder Kenny Knight says to reap the reward of a preconditioning program, cattlemen must focus on providing the data that backs up that good idea. The folks that are providing the vaccination records, uh, uh, we know what vaccine they've had, we know when they had it, and uh, those same people uh, uh, are trained to do it and do it, do it right, give the shots in the right location, uh, handle the cattle as gently as possible all the way through. If we can look at those vaccination records and know they've had these shots, we've come a long ways. Iowa data shows healthy cattle returned more than $365 per head above those treated twice for disease. A long-standing relationship between rancher and feeder build confidence in the cattle. Well, there's there's that advantage. There's added value to a calf that's had its preconditioning shots. Um, coming from someone we know, we've been dealing with for years. Um, if they give them a, a vaccination, we know that they know how to do it right. And uh, that, that makes a big difference. That difference means a smooth transition from ranch to feedlot and an easier life for cattle and cattlemen. But it makes the biggest difference in final beef quality. Cattle that spend time in the sick pen just don't produce as much premium beef as their healthier pen mates. For that rancher to do the things that, that 
we require on a preconditioning program is just making them look better, making us look better, and uh, we're, we're going to come up with a better product at the, at the store or the restaurant or wherever that market is. I'm Cindy Campbell. Thank you, Cindy. This is the year of the cicada. We're going to find out what to expect and how to protect any plantings that might receive damage when Eric Day joins us. That's straight ahead on Ag Insights. This is the year cicadas are set to emerge from the ground. Joining us today is Eric Day, an extension specialist and entomologist from Virginia Tech. Eric, welcome to Virginia Farming. Thank you for having me on. So, I think commonly we hear the year of the locust, but it's not a locust. That's true. Locusts are actually grasshoppers, but this is a phrase that get, gets used for cicadas. Um, I think when people first saw them coming out of the ground, um, first settlers, they didn't know what to call them, and so locust was a phrase from the Bible and they used it but the cicadas are actually something more closely related to an aphid. They feed on the liquid portions of the root that they can get to. Then the adults come out in huge numbers as some people will see this year. Okay, I'm gonna hold this up and we can get a close up of this on the camera, but um, let's talk a, bit, a little bit about this. Tell me what we're looking at here. He has very thin, thin wings. That's true, what you have there is an adult cicada and so they have this, this typical dark black color Red eyes, it's a little faded because that specimen's from 1961. And then they have the <laughs> orange legs and orange wings. Now the wings are very thin, but they can fly very well. The males have this drum-like structure and they make a lot of noise, as people will soon find out. And uh, they're calling the females and then the females will be laying eggs um, on the twigs of trees. Now, do they make noise with their legs, kind of like we associate crickets doing? That's, yeah, crickets use legs, but these actually have like this drum-like structure on the side of their body. And then they vibrate the drum and it makes the typical kind of noise that we expect to hear from cicadas. Wow. So when can we expect to see the cicadas or maybe hear them more than see them? When can we expect that to start happening? Um, if you have cicadas emerging on your farm or on your property, you should see them sometime in the first or second week of May. But this is all dependent. We've had a, a cool, wet spring, and so that kind of slowed the cicadas down. Um, some years, when it's cool and wet, the emergence is kind of muted, and uh, we don't hear as much noise and as much activity, as opposed to if we get some really warm, dry weather coming up, then the cicadas will be very active, and those with them will definitely know they have cicadas. <laughs> <laughs> now, can everybody in the Commonwealth expect to see these cicadas coming up or hear them? Um, their distribution is actually in the uh, central Piedmont area of Virginia, so they will be east of the Blue Ridge and west of Richmond. Um, nationally, they extend from North Carolina all the way up to New York State, so this is a fairly good-sized brood of cicadas coming out. Okay. It's not just every 17 years these insects emerge from the ground. They emerge every year. It's just that they emerge in different locations. That's true. Um, what we have now is what's called known as brood two, and those, as and in the locations we talked about. Last year we had brood one. It's known as a Blue Ridge brood, and sewed up on the Blue Ridge area of Virginia, Rockbridge County, Bedford, um, and Botetourt County. Other years, um, we have fairly big emergences. For instance, people may remember the emergence in 2004, that was brood 10, and that was mostly Northern Virginia up into Maryland, um, New York, Pennsylvania. So um, if you're an individual property will have an emergence of cicadas every 17 years. But when you look at the state um, over time, there's a different brood. Kind of every year, you'll see a different brood coming out somewhere. Okay. Now. I want to know if you can take us through the life cycle because when I, I read uh, one of your papers that you wrote for Virginia Tech and really this emergence is towards the end of their life cycle. They don't spend a lot of time above ground. That's true. They're only going to be above ground for about four to six weeks and after they get done making all the noise, the females will be laying eggs on twigs and that's where their damage comes in because they'll damage the twigs on small fruit trees and other small trees. Um, on older trees it doesn't seem to be, seem to be too bad. Once those eggs are laid on those trees, then they hatch and the tiny little cicada nymphs or immatures fall to the ground and burrow down and, get, and start feeding on the roots under the soil. And there they will be for the next 17 years. So they are there. Um, it's not like an invasion. They're, the huge numbers are there all the time, but they're kind of um, in some ways invisible to us because they're under the ground. And then they're feeding and waiting for the next 17 years. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about the damage. Um, I think people get kind of scared that we're going to have 
some major damage. We have a picture of this close up of a tree branch and the little bumps on those, those are the eggs. Yes, the, what you see, the bumps on the twigs, is actually where the, the cicadas sawed the, the twig open to lay their, lay their eggs. And so that is, that is the damage. Now on older mature trees, well-established fruit trees, this damage is not too bad. But on young trees, where those little tiny twigs will become important structural branches, that's where the damage really gets to be pretty bad for them. Okay, because this next picture we see, these are, these are some older trees, but you can see how brown they are. And that is the damage. That's true. That picture was taken late May, early June, actually along I-66, and um, that would have been the brood 10. And you can see those brown um, twigs, and there's leaves on the twigs, and those twigs have been killed by the cicadas. The leaves turn brown, and those are flags. So these flag branches are what the kind of damage you see from them. That tree recovered as though it had no problem. You can drive by it today and there's no, no trouble in that tree. But again, as you can imagine, on smaller trees, it gets to be an issue. Right, so it's the smaller trees, the saplings, that we need to protect. What your average homeowner, if they've just planted some smaller trees and want to protect them, what's their best route? They should just monitor the trees, make sure they have the cicadas, um, check for them. They might put some netting over the trees and that will help keep the cicadas off of there. If they do start have cicadas in, in damaging numbers and the netting is not working or it's not really feasible for that property, there's some insecticide sprays you can get and you can talk to your county extension agent and get that information. Okay. Now, what about for the folks who have trees, the Christmas tree growers, um, some of our orchards who have fruit trees and, and small fruit trees, what can they do to protect that many trees? Yeah, fortunately they're not too much of a pest on Christmas trees, but they're gonna be a big problem for um, establishing, uh, for orchards establishing fruit trees. Also for nurseries, we have a lot of a big green industry um, growing small trees for transplant. So they would be in the same kind of um, method as a, as a homeowner's, they would need to check the trees, possibly use netting if that's going to work in that situation, but a lot of times they'll be using some type of insecticide spray. But only again when they start seeing damaging numbers and if they have the cicada present. Okay, that kind of, it reminds me of um, the emerald ash borer, you know, we were trying to keep um, firewood and everything in its own area, and I guess that could really happen with trees, but from nurseries when they're taking them to different parts of the county, different parts of the state, but the cicadas lifespan is so short it really doesn't. Yeah, it's not really been considered much of an issue for nursery trees getting moved because when, after the eggs are laid in the twigs, they're, they're only on there for a short time before they hatch and the immatures fall to the ground. So it would be pretty unlikely to get these things moved. And a lot of nursery stock is not gonna be moved in, in May or June when these things are present. So fortunately it's not a big issue as far as moving around, but it is a, a, an issue when you, you're planting new trees. And I might add that, that most fruit growers um, um, with apple trees and, and other fruit trees, they have cicada maps and, and most of them uh, are very savvy about checking on the maps and not planting trees on the year of a cicada for their, right. their farm. So um, every once in a while someone gets caught, but um, most of them keep a very good tabs on that one. One of the many things good. I gotta keep tabs on. Well, and they can only do that with the information that you and you know, some of experts like you can provide us and the USDA with their maps and, and we appreciate all that you do to help us do that. There was one more picture I wanted to show and you said this was in your backyard and these cicadas are crawling up your iris. What you see on the iris are some that have emerged and they're getting ready to fly up in the trees and starting to make a bunch of noise. Yeah, and there, there's so many of them there in that one picture. They are a very fascinating insect. I think it's also an insect that people kind of learn a love of entomology by watching and right. kids certainly like picking them up. They're not poisonous, they don't sting, they don't bite. Um, and a lot of ways are just completely harmless. And they just make a lot of noise, yes. nature noise. Nature noise. <laughs> Eric, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on and thank you for getting the word out. No problem. We'll be right back. Controlling insects in your garden begins with knowing what kinds of pests you're dealing with. Let's join Mark Viette in the garden. Many of us may experience insect or maybe even pest problems in the garden. And there's a couple ways that we can handle these problems. You know, in many cases, we just live with it. It's not a real big deal. You know, it's just part of nature. But in the case of the woolly adelgid, which affects hemlock trees, after a few years, I remember camping up in the 
uh, national parks and forests and there were hemlock trees like this. Well, they're no longer available in the woods anymore. They've been cut down or they've fallen over. The woolly adelgid fed on them so many years, it defoliated them, it sucked the juices out of the leaves, and that's just a fact of life. But for us, we can control them with like an all season oil during the summer months. And the key is to sort of prevent the problem. Don't really let it get out of hand like you're gonna see right here. Here's the woolly adelgid right here, the little white cottony masses. They almost look like white cottony aphids. They suck the juices out of the leaves. You can see even here where some of the browning of the leaves has taken place and the leaves will fall off. And after a few years, this damage becomes very evident. A common plant that many of us have in our gardens is known as euonymus. Now this is a ground cover plant. It also can get very large, all different shapes and sizes. Great, wonderful plant. It's great to use as a screening in some cases, or you know, it's got nice variegated foliage. But most of them, or many of them, are susceptible to scale insects. And this is an insect that is sort of like a little white, tiny scale. If you look here, right at the underside of the leaves, you can see all the scale. And just if you just tap it on your shirt, you can just see all the scale. And over time, your plant just declines. It's not a hard thing to control. You know, some of your all-season oils are great to use. That will smother this insect, and a couple applications really works. But this is a common problem with this plant, and if you know how to deal with it, then you can have success growing this right in your own backyard. One way to get rid of Japanese beetles is not plant the plants that they love. And they only love about 5% of our plants. It might be our cherry trees, it might be our roses. But one thing I did find that you can do is you can get Japanese beetle traps, but don't put them in your own garden. You want them elsewhere. You might even have a neighbor you don't really like. They can put it in their garden because they'll attract Japanese beetles from hundreds and hundreds of feet away. So if you have a beetle trap in your garden, you're collecting everyone else's problem. The other thing, if you do use chemicals that you can use to spray on your plants, follow the label directions. The other thing I found is that using things as chemicals as a preventative is a little better than a curative because once you get a lot of Japanese beetles in your garden, they attract all the others with the pharaoh that they give off. It may not be easy to notice insects. Some can be so small, this the size of a tip of a pin. And you know, you have a real hard time maybe seeing thrips on dailies. These are very tiny insects. And you can see some of the damage is what you normally will see, especially on red flower dailies, is we get sort of this crinkling or whitening or discoloration. And if you get a magnifying glass, you can look very close and you'll see these very small, narrow insects. They really come from the lawn. So, you know, what happens is, is they come from the lawn and hop on your plants. Now, there's only one or two thrips per flower, but if you have a lot of thrips on your flowers, you might consider using a recommended insecticide. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at our ag calendar, there are numerous events taking place at the Virginia Horse Center in Lexington. The Virginia Classic Walking Horse Show will be held May 17th and 18th. The Shenandoah Valley Senior Expo will take place on May 21st, and the House Mountain Horse Show will be held on May 25th and 26th. Further north in Front Royal, you'll find the 27th Annual Virginia Wine and Craft Festival taking place on May 18th. Tastings from 20 Virginia wineries will be available on the seven blocks that will also feature more than 100 vendors. That does it for our show. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, offering its hardest working, smoothest riding off-road side-by-sides. Featuring the value-minded new Ranger 800 midsize, Hunt Far More Trail. Polaris has the Ranger side-by-side you want at Polaris.com. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Steve Morse, fruit grower, distiller, entrepreneur. Another personal story on FarmFamilyPeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know.